Right now, it is my pleasure to introduce our luncheon speaker today, George P. Bush. Um, George is a partner in Pennybacker Capital. I can give you a little bit of his background, and I'm sure he'll fill you in with some more. He uh, received his bachelor's degree from Rice University, and then um, he's also a UT alum. He graduated um, from the law school with his JD um, here at, from UT Austin. Prior to joining Pennybacker, he practiced law with Ank and Gump, Strauss, Howard, and Feld. Uh, doing corporate uh, and securities law. And before that, he clerked in Dallas for um, federal district uh, judge Sidney Fitzwater, who I also clerked for, so we know each other that way. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce George P. Bush. As you all know, he comes from a family with a long and storied tradition of public service, and he continues that um, as a Naval Reserves Intelligence Officer, and he recently uh, was mobilized to Afghanistan, and I'm sure he'll tell us a little bit about that as well. So please join me in welcoming George P. Bush. Thank you, Ronnie, and uh, thank you for what you do for uh, Subiendo. Um, the, the very little that I know about the organization, I've been blown away with what you guys are accomplishing this week. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a future president in, uh, in this room, and um, I'm really delighted to, to get to know you all, and my hope is that um, you guys can think of any questions that you might have for me, um, any comments you might have. Uh, about the, uh, the Bush family that you'd like to share, um, and um, any, any kind of stories you'd like me to kind of focus on, uh, because I really wanted this to be interactive and, and about you guys um, and maximizing the time that you guys have um, here on the beautiful campus, University of Texas in Austin. Um, when I was asked to talk a little bit about leadership, um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about my personal experiences, and I want to first say at the outset that I'm a truly blessed kid. Uh, to be born into, uh, into the Bush family. When I was 12 years old, my uh, grandfather was first um, elected president um, after Ronald Reagan uh, left office. But right before he was sworn in as president of the United, of the United States, I was asked to join with uh, a, a group called AmeriCares, which is one of the largest non-for-profit organizations in the world. And they deliver needed supplies to, um, to disaster recovery efforts throughout the world. And I don't know if you recall, but in 1992, there was one of the largest earthquakes recorded in human history in Armenia, which was a former Soviet um, republic, or a, a republic within kind of the shield of the so former Soviet Union. And I was asked at the age of 12 years old to fly in a cargo plane with the first supplies to, to Armenia to deliver um, much needed supplies to kids of, 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 that were victims of the earthquake. And I was totally blown away by the experience. This is a very desolate area of the world. 50,000 people died, uh, most of whom died under the rubble while they were waiting for supplies that we were attempting to deliver. The Soviets themselves were unable to deliver these supplies to, to uh, their own people. And yet we as Americans, at the height of the Cold War, we were the first ones uh, delivering these supplies. And I'll never forget uh, going to a children's hospital where a fifth grade class was, um, was sitting in class learning, their, their, um, learning their, their instruction for the day and the earthquake taking place and over half of the students died. And one kid that I met survived that rubble, uh, survived uh, during his time in the rubble after the earthquake. Um, he had lost several limbs and I delivered him a Bible because uh, this was uh, a religious school. And the kid cried and he told me this was the best Christmas he ever had. And to me, at a young age, at the age of 12, to, to have that perspective of what the true meaning of Christmas is all about was, uh, was mind-blowing. Um, following that, when my grandfather was in office, I had a chance to live in the White House, which is pretty cool. Uh, you know, Dwight D. David, uh, President Eisenhower built a, a bowling alley in the, in the basement of the White House. Uh, there's also the Rose Garden where, you know, some of my favorite professional athletes, you know, when they win the championship, they always go and say hello to the president, deliver a jersey. So that was pretty cool, uh, getting, to, getting to know professional athletes and getting their autographs. Um, but my grandmother, for those of you who may not know, Barbara Bush, kind of the silver fox of the Bush family, wears the pants, if you will, um, <laughs> she, kind of the boss. She uh, made sure that none of us as grandkids were spoiled. So she wanted us to go work at a, at a soup kitchen, which I did during the time that I lived in the White House. And again, at the, at the young age of 14, learned tremendous about, about, um, about those that are less fortunate um, in one of the poorest areas of our country. Um, when my uncle was um, elected to office from 2000 and, and served until 2008, 
I had the chance to join three American delegations uh, throughout the world. Um, and I had a chance to see more uh, perspectives, more perspectives than most, most kids my age. Uh, probably the most powerful experience was getting to go to Nicaragua, uh, Nicaragua for those that are for a different accent, but, uh, but during the first um, peaceful transfer of power in that country's history following um, a, a president by the name of Chamarro, uh, where during her swearing in, uh, the inauguration had to be called off because of violence, basically, of threats of, of, um, of her assassination. And so um, we, the, the new president that was sworn is President Bolaños. And being in a foreign country and following the American flag to the podium in which the American delegation sat down behind the newly sworn president in the first peaceful transfer of power was an amazing moment, um, especially when half the crowd was booing. Uh, the U.S. It really puts things in perspective in terms of um, in terms of, of being patriotic and, and supporting your country. Um, the point of all these stories that I wanted to convey is is the importance of giving back, the importance of volunteering, of being thoughtful of others in your community. Um, that's the the best way to become a leader, I think, um, and understanding those that that need help, those that uh, need support. Um, when I was in high school, I had the opportunity to teach inner city kids in Havana, um, in Little Havana, uh, baseball. I was, uh, the only reason why I got into Rice basically was because of my ability to play baseball. I had a chance to play with uh, Alex Rodriguez in high school, which was kind of cool, and Lance Berkman and a few other pros at Rice. But, but working um, with, with inner city kids um, in baseball and teaching them the life skills of, um, of, of basically be stepping up and being leaders in their own homes, in their own right, was, was also an important experience. In, um, in Houston, when I was at Rice, I also had the chance to, to work for a Catholic charity on the weekends with, um, with kids also in inner city schools in, in Houston. Um, and there, once again, had an incredible experience teaching English to uh, the child of an undocumented immigrant who was illiterate, even, even in Spanish. Um, and so we worked. He was a very unruly child. I was assigned by one of his teachers who had difficulties with him. Um, and we worked over the course of two years. Eventually, he, he learned English. He graduated from junior high, was the first in his family to graduate from high school. And, and being patient and working with him, um, again, was, was a transformational um, experience. And I think I grew as a person in terms of learning what, what's important in life. And to this day, I'm involved with Big Brothers, Big Sisters. I'm sure some of you in the room have, have heard about this organization. Um, there's an interesting uh, program that we're working at Big Brothers, Big Sisters, where over 90% of kids of, of felons do not go on to graduate from high school. And when you look at our state of Texas, even within the Latino population in many areas uh, of our great state, we have a dropout rate of, of over 50%. This, to me, is one of the... Uh, the, the largest crisis that we face and that your, our generation collectively will face as future educators, future leaders um, in our state and our country. And so I look forward to working with you on, on these issues. The importance of public service uh, can't be denied. You know, it's very easy. When you, when you look at uh, the voting participation rates in our country, you know, whether you're looking at the last presidential election cycle, less than 25% of 18 to 29 year olds uh, bothered to show up at the polls. Uh, many of you will be voting for the first time in the next election cycle, and I encourage you to register to vote, um, to, to get involved in that way, and get involved with the political campaign. That's the best way to, to, to learn about the issues of the day. Um, there's other w forms of public service as well. My, another experience that I had was serving in the military um, and seeing firsthand in Afghanistan, the, the fifth poorest country in the world, uh, the importance of public service. We spend $2 billion a week in, in this country, uh, rebuilding and creating a, a, a democracy in an area of the country where not a lot of people want democracy, where self-identification is more defined by tribe as opposed to country. You ask, ask the average Afghan whether they consider themselves Afghan, they consider themselves Pashto or Urdu or, or some other ethnic tribe as opposed to, um, to Afghan. And so, even though we as Americans are doing so much in Iraq and Afghanistan, part of public service has to come from, from the community, from people like all of y'all. Um, and so I, I look forward to, to further talking about the importance of that. Here in the U.S., I, I can't 
help but think about when people complain about politics and they complain about government, um, that at the same time they don't get involved and run for office or help out political campaigns or, 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 do, or volunteer in their communities. And uh, I can't help but think of, of a quote from Plato where he says that uh, the consequence of, of not being involved in your government and not being involved in public service is that you end up being governed by your inferiors. And that's not to say that our current uh, political leaders, Republican or Democrat, are, are inferiors or a cast of, of inferiors. But it is to say that if, if our generation doesn't step up, then we face um, a huge crisis, a huge deficit, where people choose not to get involved in, in public service and leadership positions. There's so many different ways to get involved outside of politics. Um, as a member of a Bush family, it's, it's easy to say, you know, go out and run for office. But there's non-for-profit organizations that I know that you all are already involved in um, in your high schools and that you will be involved in in college. Um, there's also non-for-profit organizations that uh, affect issues that, that, that you feel passionately about. And it doesn't necessarily have to be education or mentoring, uh, but there's so many different um, special interest groups that you can get involved in. And I would just encourage you all to volunteer time in your effort. Um, you know, the extra moments that you spend with um, with others makes a difference, uh, one person at a time. I remember being a, an inner city high school teacher starting out the year with, a, with 150 students. And uh, by the end of the year, I was left with about 90 students. I had several, uh, several kids drop out due to possession of narcotics, uh, possession of weapons. And what I learned is instead of looking at you know, the, the macro issues sometimes, sometimes your victories are one kid at a time, one student at a time. And so I, I encourage you to look at issues that way as well. Um, so with that, I want to turn it back to you guys um, to offer any kind, of, um, any kind of commentary that you might have. I'm, I'm, I want to open a dialogue to any questions you might have, because um, otherwise I could be up here all, all night long, uh, all afternoon long talking to you. So um, I'd encourage uh, any questions you might have. All right, hello. So, you know, I think that everything the United States does for other countries is amazing, you know, with AmeriCare, with giving back, you know, helping um, Afghanistan rebuild themselves, Iraq. But, you know, all that is happening, in the U.S., we have our own crisis. 27,000 high school students, you know, are going to be without 70% of funding because of the education budget cuts. So what is your stance on the education budget cuts? Well, thankfully, I'm not in elective politics, so I don't, uh, <laughs> I don't have a committed position on the issue. but. Uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, we have, we're spending billions of dollars um, a week, if not every month, on um, both of the conflicts in, in Afghanistan, Iraq, now Libya, um, and we're looking at other, um, other conflicts that are arising with the, the spring, um, the Arab Spring, if you will call it that, in uh, Syria and Yemen. Um, and it's, it's a generational change that many people never thought that they would see in the Middle East. And so what, what, not only rhetorically, as Americans, in terms of our foreign policy, is it important what we do, but in terms of how we commit our existing assets and resources um, is going to be vital. I, I am one to, to believe that uh, we are still the most powerful country in the world and that, that, our, matter, that, our, actions, um, that our actions matter. And so you know, I, I commend um, our current leaders for their thoughtful approach to what's what's happening in the Middle East. In terms of what's happening here in the state of Texas, absolutely. Um, it, we face an education crisis. The stats speak to themselves, whether you're talking about high school dropout rates um, in the valley uh, within the Hispanic population. Um, when you look at the state budget, education is roughly 60% of the overall budget. We had, coming, heading into this uh, legislative session, we had about a 20 to $30 billion shortfall, um, which is a pretty large, large deficit to make up. And so when you're, when you're talking about closing that gap, if you're serious about it, for better or worse, you have to look at cuts in education. So since we're doing that, unless you want to raise taxes, um, which is not always the most politically popular thing to do. Um, so when doing that, you have to balance. Where, where do we cut? Um, and one of the, uh, the, I haven't been following it as closely as most, but in terms of what we're seeing right now is is allowing for uh, more tenured teachers and you know teachers that are closer to retirement to retire early, and um, and and basically you know younger teachers that go, go into the profession are, are paid a little bit less than they than the more experienced and, and veteran teachers. 
Um, there's also, you know, looks accounting, you know, gimmicks basically to, to basically instead of have it go with inflation, um, keep it fairly flatlined for the next two years so that, um, so that revenues will catch up with spending. So long-winded way of saying that we're going to have to make some tough decisions. It's not going to please everybody. Uh, there will probably be some teachers that are let go. Um, but if we're going to be serious about, you know, balancing our budget, um, you know, you, and you're, if you're serious about doing it, you look at a majority of the budget, it's in education. And so, um, so what I would also advocate is looking at maximizing, you know, the dollars to make sure that every dollar that we're spending in education is doing what it's intended to do. So I would put everything on the table. How do we reform education to make it such that when you guys are graduating from college, you, you are paid accordingly for, for results. Um, so that if you are working in an inner, inner city school and you are taking a class of, in, in a failing school from you know, mediocre test results to, um, so, to above mediocre or above average, you should be rewarded for that. Um, and so re implementing some types of reforms I think would go a long way as well. Excellent question, by the way. You spoke of high dropout rates. What would you propose to lower those? To me, um, you know, when I was in inner, inner city high school school and um, in Miami when I was teaching, um, I was actually in the dropout prevention program. And so a lot of the kids in the state of Florida, um, and I believe it's this, the case in Texas as well, that is, is when you turn 16, you can legally drop out. So most of the kids in my class, this is freshman year, ninth grade, that were already 16. A lot of my uh, young women were, were pregnant. Um, and I already had, you know, many young men that had a prison record or, you know, had been in and out of, um, of juvenile institutions. Um, so without sounding sar sarcastic, there's going to be a percentage of, of students that we're going to be, that it's going to be very difficult to, to reach out to and change. Uh, we, we can't rescue every, every kid. But what we can do is create a curriculum that's more relevant to the lives of those that are thinking about a different path in life. As a, not every kid is going to go to, to Harvard and Yale or, or great schools like UT. What can we do in our curriculum to make, um, make it more relevant so that if kids have an interest in you know, technology or an interest in auto repair, that they can do so immediately in high school when they're not learning about you know, 16th century uh, you know, art. You know, and, and, and it's just not, not as relevant in terms of what they're going to see in terms of a tangible job out there. We're blessed to be in a state where we've created in, in the last, uh, since the beginning of the recession, almost a third of every job created in the U.S., which is unbelievable to think about. So you hit on a very important issue. How do we get that kid who is in ninth grade thinking about dropout just to hold on until 12th grade? There's been measures proposed to, to, to pay students to get through. I, I'm not a, an advocate of that. I, I do believe that if we incentivize teachers, uh, the best and the brightest that come out of our, of our uh, universities that want to take on a career in education, that they go into the inner city, like Teach for America, which is a great program, um, to go out and take on these huge challenges. Because I think with passionate teaching and passionate administration, you guys know you're in high school. You, you learn more with teachers that are, that are engaged and passionate about your, your own life. And, um, and so the, if we can incentivize and create a structure for teachers to do that, I think that would go go much longer way. Uh, hi, my name is Steven Dominguez. I'm from here in Austin, Texas. And um, well, first of all, thank you so much for sharing your story. It was very inspiring and for being here today. Uh, we have this proposal project going on that we're supposed to find um, a problem maybe within our community and how to fix it. Uh, my question is maybe what do you think that we could do um, right now becoming rising seniors, going back to our senior year in high school, and to maybe improve our community in any way, since you have such great experience. Absolutely. There, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, different issues. Um, I think mentoring is, is a big one. Um, you know, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, is, uh, I'm a huge advocate for it. There's so many different non-for-profit organizations that, that get involved um, in the community. There's recycling programs. Um, environmental programs that I think 
um, that you can build a leadership, build a board of advisors, if you will, that would uh, guide you towards um, you know, raising a certain amount of money. To um, I would consider being an entrepreneur in, in not-for-profits. Um, you know, because you're, after having visited with you, you're obviously uh, you know, a bright kid and, and a huge future. Why not create your own not-for-profit? And um, you know, create a business. You know, there's a cool industry that's developing here in Austin in terms of social entrepreneurship, where you take small business principles, go out, create a not-for-profit, write a business plan, go out and raise money, and then impact an issue that you personally feel passionate about. Rally other people around the cause, get a board of advisors of people that have experience in that area um, to allow you to go out and, and build it, build a, build a dream. Here at UT, I can't tell you how many great not-for-profits have stemmed from um, UT students that were here during college and created these wonderful business plans while they, were, while they were studying because they felt passionate about it. They found time and prioritized time in their own schedule to do it, which is uh, pretty amazing. In fact, one um, that I'm involved with here in Austin is called Eastside uh, Community Connection, where we feed uh, pr predominantly um, transient families that, that um, are either seeking political asylum in our country or, or are undocumented immigrants. And uh, you know, the poverty rate is fairly high. And while they stabilize their lives, um, you know, we help them get educated. We help feed them. We provide financial literacy um, as they get acclimated to, to Austin. The, uh, the organization was founded just six years ago. We, it was kind of a, a it's so almost like starting a small business. It's kind of a risky venture at first, but we were able to get a good board of advisors. We've got great speakers. Uh, we had Colt McCoy come one year, which is cool, and, and raised a lot of money, and, and the rest has kind of taken off. So I, would, I wouldn't rule that out as well as uh, kind of joining an existing you know, not-for-profit. Hello, so I'm George Garcia from Brunswick, Texas. And okay, so aside from funding issues and dropout rates, um, I know that compared to other leading nations in the education system, the states um, score uh, lower than 50% in some of the tests. And in fact, Washington DC, the nation's capital, scores about 6%, um, the lowest, in fact, of the whole United States. And it's just been proven that the education system is not as effective as other nations, leading nations. I want to ask you what do you think is setting us back and what we could do to improve it? That's a very good question. Um, I think, you know, to further add to your question, one of the most startling aspects where we're behind is math and science. Um, when, you can, when you look at the totality of it, we are, you know, roughly 50 percentile, but when you look at science and math, we're, we're at the bottom of industrialized nations. And so um, that's problematic um, for our future. A tiny country, the tiny country of Taiwan is producing roughly, uh, roughly 10 times the amount of patents, intellectual property, that we are producing um, as Americans. Here at UT, it's one of the few uh, you know, areas we're blessed to be surrounded by brilliant scientists and engineers that are putting out you know, intellectual property um, you know, on a daily basis, but there's not enough of that. So what I would propose is, again, going back to the point of designing a curriculum that's more germane to the lives of people um, in terms of finding a job, because I think there's this huge gap between high school and the real world. And you know, there's the, the, one of the first investors in Facebook, Peter Thiel, I don't know if you've heard of that name, he's, he's a radical on this issue. He says that much of what we're learning in, in high school is really irrelevant to, um, to what kind of jobs you're gonna take on. And so what I would propose is for those that demonstrate an interest in math and science in junior high, that there's, there's a, a feeder system for you to go on and, and work in a laboratory early on. And you're working side by side by engineers. And so there's an apprenticeship approach where you're learning with people in the field. Um, and you have an ability to get a job at, say, Exxon or Shell or a huge publicly held company that are dying for engineering and, and science talent. Um, another thing that's happening is, is that when I was using the example of rice at grad school, um, at, in the computer sciences school, I think there was roughly over 100 students. 90% were Chinese nationals. And they graduated at the top of the class. And what we did is that most of them went back to China they, because they saw more opportunity. And, and not only that, 
but you know, we, we have reduced the amount of H-1 visas that, H-1B visas, which um, we provide to those that want to learn in math and science, the ability to stay in our country, um, to take on jobs. Why not, I mean, the U.S. universe post-secondary, including UT and the analysis, is still the number one choice in the world. You, you travel across the, the world and you still see that the, the influential and in their societies are still sending their kids here. Why not tap that talent and, and create incentives for them, for them to stay, as well as change the organic structure of our own country um, to get involved more in math and science? Um, the second point that I wanted to make with respect to your question is just overall wholesale reform. Right now, our approach to education in the 20th century is a factory, is a one-size-fits-all. So in my opinion, the structure of what a school in Highland Park is the same as what you see in Brownsville. And that's not, I don't think that matches with reality. I think you have, we need to go back to a little red schoolhouse on the, on the block approach to education where, you're te where the teachers know the students, uh, there's open lines of communication, there's parent-teacher uh, interaction, um, and we've reduced the size of, of classes. I remember when I was a teacher and I had uh, over 40 students in my class, you guys know what it's like, that's, that's just pandemonium. Um, when you have, and, and when you go to um, great schools, you'll see that you're, you're going to, uh, the, the learning experience is going to be enhanced when you have more one-on-one -on -one interaction with, t with teachers as well. So reducing class sizes I think would go uh, a, a long way, and, and making schools more relevant to the communities in which they're relying as opposed to a, a factory-sized approach to, uh, to education. Hi, my name is Alexa Edwards, and I'm from Dallas. And once again, thank you for being here. And I just wanted to point out, obviously, we are the generation of technology. And I really just wanted to know your stance on technology in schools, because I know that it has its advantages and disadvantages. Advantages being, you know, it's easier to use, it's faster, you know, it's most relevant to what's going on in our society. But the disadvantages is that our skills in writing and math obviously are decreasing. So I just wanted to know, how do you think that it's better that technology is becoming such an important factor in schools, or do you think that we should pay attention more to the basics and the fundamentals? Well, I, I think uh, that's a very good question. And it's one that, you know, as, as educators constantly have to think about, honestly. I, I personally would advocate that we embrace technology. Um, you know, the, the scale by which technology is improving our lives is dramatic. There's definitely downside. I mean, you, taking the experience of being a high school teacher, most of my students, um, you know, basically write in short, truncated sentences as opposed to well thought out paragraphs. That's certainly a downside. But the upside is that you're, you're catching a, a huge tidal wave. Um, you know, companies like Apple, uh, Facebook, Google, um, really were, were created by entrepreneurship and creativity. And I think if we are embracing technology um, in, a, in a secondary education environment, we're giving uh, young Americans a chance to to think about how we can further innovate and, and further think of ways to make you know, technology more interesting and relevant to the lives of, of the world. That's one of the advantages that we have, I think, as Americans, is that, um, is that we have Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is now exporting more um, than just about any other region of our country because you, know, you, you read the articles in India um, and China about the latest Apple products that are released, you see lines going out the door. Um, we've traditionally, as Americans, have exported, um, you know, Chevys and cars, and I think those days are, are gone. Um, but everybody around the world has got a Facebook account. Um, and so I think to the extent that we can dovetail technology with, um, with high school education and make it, make it relevant um, and apply business models to, um, to what's out there, I think that it's an exciting thing. Um, without losing grasp of, of fundamental education, the X's and O's that, that, um, that kids need before you know, graduating. Hello, I'm Fernando Rizzali, a deaf student from Wangfield Daycare, and I just filed to be a surgeon. I want to know what is the what is the option of the what is the, what do you think is the growing problem in the medical community? It's a growing problem in the medical community that requires the attention of everybody here. Do, do you mind uh, restating, please? Sorry. Sorry, um, 
No, no, no. Um, I want to raise your option that what do you think is the growing problem in the medical community? In the uh, which community? Medical community? What do you think is, a, is the uh, growing problem of the medical community? Very good question. It's, all, it's uh, definitely at the center of everybody's mind in terms of um, you know, the recent proposal that has come from, um, from the White House in terms of, of what the future of healthcare looks like in our country. Um, not only that, but applications to medical schools um, are, are down significantly. It's no longer viewed as, as uh, the profession in many respects as, as it once was. Unfortunately, there are too many lawyers, in the, uh, and I can say that as a lawyer. Um, and, and I would not discourage you to, to, to not look at medicine. I think it's a wonderful profession, and um, you know, it's obviously um, been beneficial to our country. Um, but in my opinion, my humble opinion, I think there needs to be, similar to my thoughts on education, there needs to be reform with respect to, to healthcare. Um, one of the great things about our country is, is having optionality, whether it's um, you know, going down the street to, to get uh, McDonald's as opposed to Burger King, or um, hopefully choosing the school that you want to send your kids to as opposed to another school, that the same would apply to healthcare, that you would get to choose basically what doctor you see for what purposes um, and at what time, as opposed to having mandates that kind of dictate how healthcare should look like. I, I'm a, I'm a, I believe in decentralized government where whether you're talking about you know, education, healthcare, um, that power you know, basically flows to, to local communities because people have different needs um, in different parts of our country. So there's obviously a looming crisis. You look at um, as a percentage of our national budget um, and this has been the discussion of the Medicare and Medicaid discussion. Entitlements are roughly 60% of our, of our total budget, and healthcare represents about a third of that. And so, um, again, it's similar to the question about, you know, Texas education. You know, you really can't talk about uh, reducing the size of our debt without talking about healthcare. So, you know, we really have a lot of um, important decisions ahead of us. Thankfully, I'm not in politics, so I don't have to worry, worry as much about it. Hi, my name is Jennifer. Um, actually, I will be moving to Baltimore after this and doing Teach for America. So I'm really excited about that. Thank That's you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, but my question, um, you were talking about, um, I guess, training um, different schools to do, I guess, vocational opportunities for students. But I think my concern with that would be um, getting teachers or counselors who automatically uh, assume um, minorities would eventually go that route and not give them the opportunity for them to actually excel in their studies. Yeah. So my question for you would be, how would you prevent that from happening for students instead of, you know, giving them a chance to succeed in school and their studies versus, you know, just automatically assuming a vocational route for them? Absolutely. That's a great, uh, great point and a great question. Because it, it can't be a self-selecting criteria, mainly because of your background as a student and what community you reside in. It would be an opt-in program where basically um, teachers and the students basically would have to make that, that decision together as, as a joint decision as opposed to you know, some higher power from Austin, Texas or Washington, D.C. deeming you to be a kid who's going on a certain, certain track as opposed to one that you desire. Um, so I, I probably should clarify that in terms of um, in terms of having a, a curriculum that's more relevant to the to the um, to the lives of those. I, I, I just think that there's a wonderful opportunity to to reapproach education in a way that there's an open canvas in which we really delve into the interests of of students and um, and creating the bridge between um, growing up in the community and going off to a job of the future. Because um, even though we have more Forbes 500 companies in this state than any other uh, state in the country, so in other words, there's a lot of opportunity out there, we still, in my opinion, have not created a pipeline by which um, where, where these students can go on and um, get those jobs of the future that for companies that are innovative and going out and creating. I mean, Facebook, for example, they've just moved a large office here to Austin, which is really exciting. 
Um, and they're, they're going to bring, I think, roughly 1,500 employees, LegalZoom.com, uh, Zynga. And so what's happening here in Austin on the tech side of things um, is really exciting. Back to your, your question earlier about whether, whether we can embrace technology. And if a kid early on demonstrates an interest in saying, that's the company I want to work for. I want to work for Facebook, and I want to be CEO one day. Creating a curriculum that would allow a kid, instead of learning about you know, medieval, and I'm a history major, medieval uh, military history or something, um, wouldn't be the most relevant to getting that job. So, um, so creating a structure I think that's flexible would be, would be ideal. Um, hi, my name is Perla Roman. I'm from Houston, Texas. I have a question about immigration and education. As I personally have friends who have dropped out of high school claiming that they can't pursue a career or go to college because of their legal status. So I would like to know what's your stand on granting um, illegal immigrant students citizenship? Well, there's been a proposal um, that was pending in Congress uh, called the, the DREAM Act, which would allow uh, the children of undocumented immigrants the ability to obtain um, state citizen, uh, state citizens, um, same tuition as, as state kids, basically in-state tuition is, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and that was uh, recently, it's basically scuttled in, in the Senate. Um, I think there's ways, there's, there's a middle ground, because obviously it's a very competitive education environment. And there are families here in Texas who feel slighted that children of undocumented immigrants get the same pay-in um, price point as, um, as an in-state person. I, I think there's, litmus, there's a litmus test. Instead of looking at it as you know, black and white, that there's a spectrum there. So if, if, um, if an undocumented if family, if let's say, um, and I'm just talking all out here because you know, this is UT and we think creatively, um, is that, uh, is that you know, if the parents demonstrate an ability to pay back taxes, um, have taxes with, withheld on a going forward basis so they're paying into the system, uh, so there's less kind of concern about where um, you know public funding stands in terms of um, where the kid stands and what they're what they're taking from the system, um, and they demonstrate over a certain amount of years a, uh, um, a a kind of a continuous occupation, and you know there's a fluence in English and that there's um, you know no commission of felony felonies during that time, that we're beginning to move in a direction where I think we should allow for in-state tuition because, again, it goes back to the issue about how we make changes um, to, uh, to our education system and, and creating incentives by which we have very talented people that were, had no control over where, uh, where they were born and where they were educated and what their legal status is. So there's, there's a, I, many people in immigration, unfortunately, view it as a black and white issue. And, Republicans are just as guilty as Democrats in that issue for being um, not constructive in this debate. There are 20 million undocumented immigrants that live in our country today. This is another issue that we as, a, as our generation will face. And, how do, and they're having kids. They're having a lot of kids. Um, you know, in the Anglo community, uh, the average um, child per family is, is less than 2.1, which is roughly the amount you need to you know, keep your, po your population growing. And among the Hispanic community, it's, it's, it's above that, which is great. We need to embrace, um, you know, we need to embrace a vibrant immigrant community. That's what our country was built on. And, um, and you know, I think there's, there's got to be incentives there for the kids that uh, want to get a higher education. Um, so, I'm, again, I'm glad I don't have to deal with that issue because I think it's a complicated one. But um, because when people talk about immigration, it touches on every issue indirectly, education, healthcare, uh, national security, um, drug trafficking. So, um, but I'm, I'm for uh, proposals like the DREAM Act. Um, I think it's a, it's a wonderful um, incentive to make sure that, um, that there are incentives there to get a higher education. We shouldn't be dis discouraging. So I mean, thinking of 